Laredo Battle, part of the South Central Invasion Sector Scenario. Even as forces to the south were crossing into the southernmost tip of Texas in the McAllen area slash Lower Rio Grande Valley, approximately 167 miles to the north in Laredo, Group armies 7 through 13 were actively initiating hostilities within their invasion sector. Even as the tandem anti-satellite weapon strikes and cyber attack was underway, massive artillery, missile, and airstrikes began near instantaneously. As the 10th Group Army, being a, another reserve unit of the large ready reserve of China, known as PLA, led its particular invasion prong within this sector of the invasion. 10th Signals Regiment, responsible for SIGINT, ELINT, and electronic warfare capabilities within the 10th Group Army, utilized its ground-based version of the KG-600 electromagnetic jamming systems as well as its more traditional systems in order to shut down the redundant American systems such as radar and radio equipment as which these may not have been hackable due to not being connected to the internet like the military networks were, or not directly affected by the anti-satellite strikes. As the first waves of coalition aircraft of various types screamed overhead, one particular squadron had been assigned specifically to the Laredo area, area of operations or AO, to conduct air superiority operations in this particular battle space, being a 50 by 50 mile battle space. As well as to conduct limited ground strikes in support of the units active in the field. Such was the case as all fighters, at least early on day one of the invasion, were mostly loaded with air-to-air -air munitions and limited amounts of air-to-ground ordnance as ground strikes were largely left to tactical ground attack aircraft operating within their specific role as such, and also by much larger and much heavier strategic bomber aircraft which carried enormous payloads on board of air-to-ground ordnance. This specific squadron assigned to this specific AO was a J-16 squadron consisting of 12 aircraft of the type. The J-16 was a very versatile, very advanced 4.5 generation combat aircraft in the PLAAF arsenal of China. This is the J-16 squadron flying into, their, into the American airspace within the AO. While able to drop a small quantity of laser, satellite-guided, or unguided ordnance, or fire certain types of air-to-ground missiles of different varieties, as far as limited amounts of such within just the first sortie, most of the heaviest firepower was actually delivered by ground-based artillery systems, such as rocket and howitzer-based platforms, as well as cruise missile and tactical ballistic missile strikes delivered by battalions belonging to the PLA Strategic Missile Forces branch of China's armed forces, such as 
the 612th Brigade of the Strategic Missile Forces, the 613th Brigade of the Strategic Missile Forces, the 12th and 13th, as well as the 616th Brigade of the Strategic Missile Forces here within the borders of the USA as a Trojan unit embedded and hidden within a CCP property, they were primarily responsible for China's end of the cruise and ballistic missiles, apart from, of course, all of the container-based missile systems of YJ-18Cs and caliber cruise missiles, four per container, hidden throughout the nation, timed to begin their volleys at 2 a.m. or two hours into the invasion itself. Of the 10th Group Army itself, leading this particular invasion prong, and thus conducting the Laredo battle from the Sino-Russian coalition's end of the matter, the 43rd Artillery Brigade of the 10th Group Army, with its PL-66 towed 155mm howitzers and PLL-01 155mm howitzers within their respective battalions, as well as its PHL-81 122mm rocket artillery systems within their specific battalions, and PHL-03 systems, which are 300mm rocket artillery platforms, all rained down a torrent of munitions upon American targets, already pre-selected prior to the beginning of the invasion, as per collected and analyzed intelligence ascertained and sorted by both the MSS, or Ministry for State Security, which is a combination of China's secret internal police and foreign intelligence agency, as well as the PLA's Strategic Intelligence Bureau of the Joint Staff Department, being a key centerpiece of the PLA's decision-making processes. Artificial intelligence also played a vital role in terms of aiding drastically and decisively in the role of decision-making in terms of the sheer rapidity of processing data of all types including updating, targeting upon the modern fluid battlefield, making it possible to respond to changes on the battlefield much faster than ever before, making it to where an opponent almost had zero opportunities to adequately respond, save for a very few minute cases of such occurring. Targeting data and ever-changing target list, which even included changing priorities of such, was massively assisted by the advent of some of the most advanced AI in existence, streamlining the decision-making processes like never before seen. Other units belonging to the 10th Group Army contained within themselves their own artillery battalions, such as the Type 83 155mm self-propelled gun battalion of the 165th Armored Brigade, which the 165th Armored Brigade being right here, and this being its self-propelled howitzer battalion right here of 152mm Type 83 howitzers, Also, the two battalions of PCL-181s, which were 155mm truck-mounted 155mm howitzers of the 3rd Light Mechanized Infantry Division, or 3rd LMI Division, right here, which afforded them extreme mobility due to the simplicity of the design and being on a truck-based system, making it far easier to maneuver on the modern battlefield as was needed by such light forces of the LMI division, the 3rd LMI. And 
the PLZ-05 self-propelled howitzer battalion within the 17th Infantry Division, which was a 155mm howitzer, the PLZ-05, and there was a battalion of which within the 17th Infantry Division, which this is the 17th Infantry Division in the far southernmost flank. And this is its artillery battalion right there. Air Defense Artillery was also a prominent component of the 10th Group Army, and every Group Army in general, with nearly all Group Armies containing a dedicated Air Defense Artillery Brigade, or the very occasional division of such. Along with the other subunits of the 10th Group Army, maintaining one or two battalions, in some instances, of short-range air defenses for local force protection, which themselves commonly consisted of sy systems such as the self-propelled SPAAA-95s, which were a radar-directed quad 25mm cannon with four QW-2 infrared-seeking missiles, and other systems like it, like the HQ-7B systems, which were also another short-range air defense missile system, and there were even occasionally the rare truck-mounted 57mm cannons, as normally these were typically found within third-tier units, such as National Militia Paramilitary Forces, which were normally a strictly home defense type oriented force of parallel of a parallel military element and therefore not a part of the PLA proper or regular PLA Chinese armed forces. Of the air defense artillery forces present, only the 38th Air Defense Artillery Brigade within the 10th Group Army had medium and longer range air defense artillery systems. This being the 38th Air Defense Artillery Brigade here. These being the battalions that comprise it. Uh, of the ADA forces present, or Air Defense Artillery forces present, only the 38th Brigade within the 10th Group Army had medium and longer range air defense artillery systems, as these together with the other 10th Group Army subunits air defense battalions within, with their short-range systems came together to provide a layered air defense for the combat forces of the Group Army. In terms of the 38th Air Defense Artillery Brigade, it was arrayed in similar fashion to the 18th Air Defense Artillery Brigade of the 16th Group Army itself leading the invasion in the lower Rio Grande Valley in the McAllen, Texas area. This particular Air Defense Artillery Brigade, being part of the 30, being this, this particular ADA Brigade being the 38th Air Defense Artillery Brigade of the 10th Group Army, had within it two HQ-2J battalions, one HQ-6A Battalion, one HQ 11 battalion, and two SPAAA 95 battalions for close in air defense. Being that the 10th Group Army was a reserve formation, like many other group armies fully mobilized to take part in the invasion, it operated some older, albeit highly upgraded and still highly lethal systems, such as the medium-range but high-altitude HQ-2J. The older iterations of this system had an outstanding kill record when exported to North Vietnam during the Vietnam War, and even downed multiple American-made, Taiwanese-operated U-2 high-altitude spy planes, which had violated China's airspace during the early 60s. With years of upgrades to the guidance systems, these still proved to be highly capable lethal weapons platforms, even in the hands of well-trained reservists such as the troops of the 38th Air Defense Artillery Brigade. Active PLA units themselves, as well as even a decent quantity of other reserve group armies, fielded even newer, far more advanced air defense artillery systems such as the HQ-9B, HQ-22, HQ-18, as well as others. However, 
There was no air threat in this area to speak of, so air defense artillery units added security presence to rear areas behind the advancing combat troops. Although the HQ-11 and HQ-6A battalions did see rare occasional uses, for the time being, at least in Laredo, the skies were empty, and this would come a bit later for the troops of those two battalions of the 38th Air Defense Artillery Brigade. Under the cover of their heavy artillery, missile, loitering munition, and air cover, the troops crossed the Rio Grande River immediately at midnight, having advised local Mexican border authorities to quickly abandon their posts 20 minutes before the invasion was to commence to maintain secrecy right up to the invasion initiation, the forward units of the 1st Battalions of both the 165th Armored Brigade and 3rd Light Mechanized Infantry Division seized and raced across key bridges, quickly overrunning American border security paramilitary forces, themselves only possessing small arms and some MRAP vehicles and passed down M113 armor personnel carriers at very best and at worst, simple trucks and SUVs. Other battalions simply crossed the shallow Rio Grande, where the banks weren't too steep for vehicle crossings, emerging upon the American side of the border and thereby sprinting onward insofar as both vehicles and any dismounted troops were concerned. All battalions, even at their smallest company levels, broken down, headed for their assigned objectives, with all elements given their own specific task assignments to tackle. Within merely only 30 minutes, the city had been fully run through by the 3rd Light Mechanized Infantry Division, having crossed the river in many areas, including the bridge, running straight through the city as the 165th Armored Brigade crossed the same area, although they hooked and turned south before on, on Route 83, a state highway, before turning to the east and continuing. The 3rd LMI Division itself was given the assignment of securing the city of Laredo as it was the literal gateway straight up the middle of America as I-35 began, literally under one kilometer beyond crossing from Mexican Route 2 bridge and into Laredo from there at the border. Here was an example of a small excerpt of the battle at the border between the 3rd Light Mechanized Infantry Division forces encountering the local border paramilitary forces of the Americans under artillery support from their own PCL-181 truck-mounted 155mm howitzers firing from across the river on the Mexican side of the border within their own combat outposts as such. HESCO barriers topped with razor wire, with guard towers, with machine gunners in them, as you can see on the corners. There's the ammo dump, a shipping connex with sandbags to protect it, gun crews with their howitzers firing heavy 155 millimeter artillery shells. This was the battle literally erupting here at this bridge, right before I-35. As this battle was occurring, you had elements, company-sized elements from a battalion, just one battalion, attacking and crossing the bridge and river in shallow areas where it was easy to ford it, under the cover of their own precision artillery fire from their own PCL-181 truck-mounted self-propelled howitzers. These were all precision strikes levied upon the now surprised and shocked forces of the 
border paramilitary security forces on the American side. As you can see, after the headquarters uh, battalion of the 3rd Light Mechanized Infantry Division had fired a salvo of 48 CH-901 loitering munitions, which the CH-901A has the ability to stay airborne for over an hour and can be fitted with either an HE, a fragmentation, or heat warhead, which is a high-explosive anti-tank warhead. These were all fitted with HE, as the headquarters units typically had dedicated drone sections that operated these drones and were the most qualified units to operate such. Although they could be tube-fired from other types of forces on an individual basis, firing one per tube, but the TEL-like systems that the headquarters units typically operated could fire 48 at a time. There were eight in just this specific ep excerpt of the larger battle that was occurring within Laredo and Nueva Laredo, where they were crossing from. This is a headquarters com uh, platoon of one of the companies with its VP-11 MRAPs guarding its Shangji trucks, its MVP 4-3M fueler, its Type 84 armored recovery vehicle, and the trucks and the troops are outside in this park. They're, they're all within this park. The troops are awaiting their orders. Radio communication was a constant. All of these light mechanized infantry forces, as well as all the other combat forces, all operated small quadcopter reconnaissance drones of their very own that linked into their combat data links, which constantly fed all the changing intel on the fluid battlefield into the AI systems, which were then monitored by analysts, intelligence officers, who then provided the intel to commanders to make much better, faster decision-making as all the data gathered by advancing units or high-flying drones, such as these drones on this battlefield, these CH-4A armed recon drones or the CH-3A plane reconnaissance drone, which wasn't armed, and another CH-4A up here. These are much higher flying reconnaissance drones. The armed ones, the CH-4As, could carry six different air-to-ground munitions, be it air-dropped munitions or be it air-to-ground missiles. And they constantly fed a stream of data into the combat data links, which is also processed by the AI systems, monitored by the intelligence officers and analysts, streamlined, given to the command, so that they could make faster, more appropriate decisions as targeting data changed and forces moved on the fluid modern battlefield. Heading back to the battle at the bridge, what occurred as the Artillery strikes came in from their own artillery forces and impacted within the city. Precision strikes were made on targets consisting of the paramilitary vehicles themselves or clusters of these paramilitary forces, as well as the CH-901As targeting specific vehicle types, whether they be MRAPs or some of the hand-me-down M113s that were often provided to American paramilitary agencies via programs where the Army would pass down old equipment, as we all know such programs exist within America. Well, these vehicles were being hit by both artillery, by CH-901 loitering munitions, such as these two MRAPs attempting to guard the entryway onto I-35, where it literally begins, just a kilometer into the city. This map is only a nearly one by one and a half mile map. This is just a small excerpt of the larger battle. As other forces of the 3rd LMI Division crossed to the north, they began to come down as pockets began to be surrounded and eliminated block by block, along with the precision artillery strikes, so often being danger close, but the chi -coms delivered the precise coordinates as far as the artillery was concerned, and it was steel on the target, as the artillery term goes. 
and none of their troops suffered any friendly fire incidents, as well as the precision loitering munitions crashing into their specific vehicle targets, be they regular trucks or SUVs or the M113s that appeared every so often on this map, or the MRAPs, like your Max Pro MRAPs, made by International. You also have these troops in rolling shield maneuvers where the vehicles, which being that this is the 3rd Light Mechanized Infantry Division, they were all in wheeled armor personnel carriers and infantry fighting vehicles. Their infantry fighting vehicle was the WZ551 IFV variant, which fired either a 25mm autocannon or an upgun to a 30mm autocannon, but within this particular battalion, they were still operating the 25mm versions of the WZ551 infantry fighting vehicle variant. There were no anti-tank missiles pods on the sides of the turrets, although in the armor personnel carrier version, there was a gunner's hatch where a crew serve heavy machine gun would go, whether it was a 12.7 millimeter, like a 50, a Chinese 50 cal basically, or an even larger 14.5 millimeter anti-material heavy machine gun, and occasionally a lighter 7.62 millimeter machine gun, but mostly they operated the WZ-85 heavy 12.7 millimeter machine guns as their crew serves on their armor personnel carriers delivering a heavy weight of firepower along with the 25 millimeter autocannons delivering their blasting 25 millimeter ammunition. Now the individual troops did carry light anti-tank weapons such as Type 69 rocket propelled grenade like weapons as well as the occasional HJ-08 anti-tank missile which were fired liberally at the American targets hitting vehicles or troop concentrations of these paramilitary forces at the border guarding the border, as along with the artillery strikes and the CH-901 loitering munition strikes, this became a kill box. Now, different companies, upon crossing the bridge, went around to secure other parts of the city along with others that had come down from the north and others that have cut across to go straight east, creating cordons to sweep areas for groupings of paramilitary troops, such as done right here, where a large cordon was done around this grouping before sweeping that area of the city of them, as well as being done by the bridge with the smaller group, which there's nothing to represent them because it was a smaller group than 300. This was only about 50 or 60 total, not including the vehicle operators, which would have been more, but this was a smaller grouping of border guards. The Mexicans had fled their border posts before the invasion was to kick off. You have APCs and IFVs smashing the fencing here. You have a line formation of Chinese troops to provide support, fire support to pin down these forces over here, along with their IFVs and APCs providing mobile fire support for them, all as their other forces cross the bridge under the cover of their suppressing fire. Of course, there's the artillery fire. You have a wedge formation of dismounts here firing across the river, covering the bridge, firing this way or this way. You have the rolling shield forces here within this platoon. There's a few different companies operating this area, three, but you're only seeing portions of each of the three companies as this is a small map of a much larger battle. And it takes eight companies to comprise a battalion as far as the Chicom forces are concerned, so you had lots of activity going on to say the least. I-35 was a prime objective, probably the most important one, which this city, this battle, was one of the most strategically important battles of the entire border campaign because the gateway to I-35 was literally the gateway up the center of America, so securing Laredo was of prime importance for the CHICOM forces involved. 
They did take some POWs that surrendered due to the shock and awe of the campaign and eliminated many others. But this was a viciously brutal battle occurring at the border. Farther to the south, the 17th, at the 17th Infantry Division's crossing point, Simple barbed and concertino wire barriers were easily overrun by its multiple mechanized infantry battalions and one armored battalion as the 17th Infantry Division began its infiltration of the nation, going for its objectives. Opposing this entire mammoth-sized invasion prong were the battalions belonging to the 72nd Infantry Brigade Combat Team, a subunit of the Texas National Guard's 36th Infantry Division, which is a parent unit, the 36th ID right here, and then a subunit, the 72nd Infantry Brigade Combat Team right below, and then all the sub-battalions that comprise this Infantry Brigade Combat Team. There was the 172nd Brigade Engineering Battalion. The 536th Brigade Support Battalion. The 3rd Battalion of the 138th Infantry Regiment right here in Laredo, having camped out in various city parking areas or parking garages, which was their bivouac area within the city limits. The 3rd of the 141st Infantry Regiment, occupying a sort of combat outpost very close to the interstate of I-35 right here. And then the 1st of the 112th, or the 1st Squadron of the 112th Cavalry Regiment, a squadron in American cavalry terms equaling a battalion-sized unit, which itself had just recently been dropped off with all its vehicles at a temporary bivouac area right here, and before the invasion, its purpose was to drive the short distance down to the border area with the 172nd Brigade Engineering Battalion to assist in fortifying its already constructed combat outposts where there were multiple here constructed by this very battalion itself in the past due to previous border operations conducted by the Guard and the various paramilitary border forces that handled these operations alongside of them. And of course, the headquarters of Headquarters Company, which was so badly shelled at the beginning of the invasion, right outside of city limits in a field. It was so badly shelled at the start of the invasion by 122mm rockets, 152mm howitzer shells, and 155mm howitzer shells that it ceased to even exist as a command and control element. It was also hit by cruise missiles as well, caliber and YJ-18Cs, which many of those began to fire from their container-based systems only two hours into the whole invasion itself. By then, the artillery had mostly done the job insofar as it relates to handling the ordinary command and control, which is the HHC of the whole 72nd Infantry Brigade combat team itself. It was heavily pummeled and smashed into dust by all the artillery forces. All battalions of the 72nd Infantry Brigade Combat Team, albeit with only one additional battalion to the north and out of the battle space in an entirely different battle space, that comprised the 72nd Infantry Brigade Combat Team, all of the aforementioned. With the 
with the mentioned National Guard forces were the alphabet paramilitary forces, as well as armed civilian clusters, basically reactionary armed civilians, although well-meaning individuals trying to instantaneously resist the invasion without any real actionable intelligence on the situation, and therefore no real plan, coordination, or communication, essentially having no real concept of the level of sheer brutality being wrought upon them, and no effective way to even fight back, lacking any sort of anti-armor weapons at first, save maybe for some Molotovs, but definitely no air defense capabilities to speak of. And as of the moment, no logistical networks and coherent strategy to even resist. All of this along with a total lack of competent leadership and organization, with very scant few exceptions this early on in the invasion. All of these different listed forces broke quickly beneath the pulverizing weight and yoke of vicious pummeling missile, artillery, drone, and air strikes, often unable to even see their attackers, much less where they were even coming from, causing elements of defenders to often be herded together into kill boxes where they would be gradually annihilated by concentrations of different firepower focused all upon one specific area. Within this battle map, in the very most northern section, there was the 38th Air Defense Artillery Brigade. Its SPAAA-95 battalions, which these vehicles had radar-directed quad 25mm cannons for short, close-in air defense, as well as four QW-2 fire-and-forget missiles, as they're called, which are infrared homing missiles for short-range air targets. They directed their cannons, their 25mm cannons, at American paramilitary forces right across the river, along with their actual troops using their small arms, in other words, their QBZ-95 rifles, their QYJ-201 light machine guns, as well as other small arms to fire across the river and wither down American paramilitary forces who eventually retreated from the area. Of course, there was an armed recon drone that assisted them in this endeavor, a CH-4A, which fired HJ-08 anti-tank missiles at the fleeing paramilitary forces trying to mount up in their vehicles and speed away from the vicious attack from the Air Defense Artillery Forces of the 38th Air Defense Artillery Brigade. Moving south, you have the Independent Headquarters Battalion encapsulating the command elements of the entire 10th Group Army itself with its commander and all of its intelligence sections and others belonging to this very important battalion as it commanded the entire Group Army, all its forces. To the north, in another battle space, you had the 4th PAP Corps belonging to the 2nd Mobile Contingent of the PAP with its units engaged in a battle on the northern flanks in a separate battle space, being Dolores West and Panitas Ranches, which is a whole separate battle, but might as well be part of the same as this battle space was directly to the south of that one. You have PLA Group Army 7 through 13. Apart from this 10th Group Army, you have the rest of the Group Armies behind getting in convoy formation, preparing to cross as soon as all resistance has been annihilated in this 50 by 50 mile battle space. You have the 3rd Light Mechanized Infantry Division, who itself was tasked with clearing and defeating all resistance within Laredo and securing the most important objective of all, I-35, as this key invasion route was of the utmost paramount importance to the whole invasion, especially in this sector, as 
This invasion prong was set to go all the way north, even into Kansas, taking this very route, before peeling off as rapid reinforcements for the Trojans already deep inside America, capturing their objectives, acting as a relief force or reinforcements for those forces. You have the 165th Armored Brigade here, and its component battalions. It operates Type 96B main battle tanks. It operates the Type 83 self-propelled howitzers within its artillery battalion. It has a combat engineer battalion, headquarters battalion. And it crossed the same area, first going into Laredo before hooking south and then hooking to the east and going straight for its specific objectives in that area, clearing the flanks of the city to the south. You had the 43rd Artillery Brigade pummeling the entire area with its howitzer and rocket artillery, as shown, reaching out many miles, especially as it relates to the 300 millimeter rocket artillery in particular. Then there is the 10th Group Army's 10th Signals Regiment, responsible for electronic warfare, its communications hub, as well as its signals intelligence and electronic intelligence. And then there was the 17th Infantry Division, whose sole objective was to crush all resistance on the southernmost flanks of the invasion as they were to cross the Rio, engage any border forces before crossing State Highway 83 before making for their objectives in the area. You have your air support in the form of J-16 fighter aircraft, 4.5 generation, very advanced fighter jets, four different drones over the area, two CH-4A armed recon drones flying high above the area, sending back constant data feeds of updated intelligence reports as it videoed and surveilled every movement going on on the ground, as well as this CH-3A doing the same, constantly updating all the combat data links of the ground troops, showing them where enemy forces were before the enemy forces even knew what hit them. As the 17th Infantry Division's battalions crossed the border, eliminating paramilitary American border forces, they crossed the State Highway 83, which ran parallel to the river coming south from Laredo, before attacking a border area of combat outposts originally created and established by the 172nd Brigade Engineering Battalion used in previous border security operations. Similar to the 136th MP Battalion much further south, 167 miles south in South Texas, this too was a series of border fobs originally created by this very National Guard Battalion, again, for border security operations due to the failed border policies conducted in the past. It was being heavily hit by artillery and is the next sub-battle that will be viewed as this battle was erupting all over the map. The one... 72nd Brigade Engineering Battalion was being hit particularly hard by artillery and then by ground forces of the 17th Infantry Division. As 155 and 152 millimeter shells raked the entire area largely focused upon specific fortified forward operating bases created by the troops of the 172nd who'd bulldozed huge berms of soil with erected atop both barbed and concertina wire along with portable guard booths and guard towers 
along the perimeter, all protected by sandbags, all created and manned years prior in support of previous border operations mounted by American forces overall within this specific area. These older fob chains within the area now served as the literal front-line defenses of the nation, at least along the borders against the external components viciously battering their way into the land. However, the enormity of the Trojan shock army components in every corner of the nation made defending the nation at its actual borders a useless endeavor, not to mention against such an, a massive force. Also, these fobs manned by American forces lacked any real protection against artillery, much less mortars, or also especially against air attacks. These fobs were essentially designed with defending against primarily small arms and possibly anti-tank systems such as RPG-style weapons in mind. In other words, the tents and portable buildings comprising these installations were blasted into literal pieces and shreds along with the vehicles and the motor pools all along with them as it related to the structures which themselves were those vehicles belonging to the different companies comprising the whole 172nd Brigade Engineering Battalion. These forward operating bases themselves had been constructed upon farm and ranch lands, once again leased from local landowners, same as was also the case in the McAllen, Texas battle. Simultaneously occurring to the south, as well as elsewhere all along the border as it related to the battles now erupting. Many of these forward operating bases were also targets of cruise missile strikes, such as caliber M's and YJ-18s, among a variety of other weapons within that category. By this early stage in the overall campaign as a whole, it had not quite struck even 2 a.m. yet, the pre-designated time that the container-based Club K and YJ-18C missiles, built by Russia and China respectively, were set to begin firing to and from various positions within the nation itself to add shock value as well as to coincide with most of the Sino-Russian coalition units beginning to initially reach their first objectives by hour two. However, other missile forces were ample in number elsewhere and able to contribute to the first two hours of the fighting in lieu of the container-based missile systems that were set to fire at, later at two. Whether by sea-based or land-based, which sea-based being ships or subs, or land-based being TEL-fired systems, or air-launched cruise missiles from strategic bomber aircraft or strike aircraft. As had been the case at the Padre Island International Airport battle during the larger McAllen, Texas area hostilities, the 125th Coastal Defense Brigade's Caliber M Missile Battalion had fired their TEL-based missiles in support of the 10th or of the 16th Group Army. I'm sorry, as of the 10th Group Army, as the 172nd Brigade Engineering Battalion's forward operating base chain was at the outermost range of the 125th's Missile Battalion's range of their Caliber M's and thereby still able to effectively target the area by being just within the outer ranges of their missiles from where they were in Mexico. Many other Chinese, Russian, and other allies' missile elements were also well employed, hitting ample targets within the vast nation. Truly a target-rich environment. 
Meanwhile, Chinese ground forces of the 17th ID Infantry Division, including its first armored or its one armored battalion, converged upon the already bombarded area of the engineer battalion's forward operating bases, forming a massive semicircle around a massive area totaling a grand total of eight by five miles, with battalions employing their respective companies comprising them, with battalions employing their respective companies that were comprising them to take up their own respective sectors as several companies push down the center of the line to lead a mopping up effort, finding few survivors from the first several forward operating bases as they came into view. American platoons that had responded quickly enough getting out of a fob that hadn't been hit as of the time the first fob fell were engaged by heavy fire from one 25 millimeter tank shells and coax machine guns of the same being 7.62 by 54 millimeter rounds as well as heavy turret 12.75 machine guns by the tank turret gunners. In addition, fire from infantry fighting vehicles 100 millimeter shells 30 millimeter autocannons and their anti-tank missile systems such as HJ-08s on the ZBD-04s belonging to the 17th IDs mechanized infantry forces, as well as even armor personnel turret gunners firing their 12.7 millimeter heavy machine guns, their W-85 heavy 12.7 millimeter machine guns, supporting them even before their fire support companies with their short-range 130mm MLRS systems and potent PLL-05 120mm dual assault gun slash mortars even were able to catch up yet to their fast-moving mechanized infantry companies themselves. As in, the forces, the combat forces were moving so fast, their fire support companies as part of the mechanized infantry battalions hadn't even caught up yet to set up to fire. As for the Armored Company, as of yet, their anti-tank company, as uh, I'm sorry, as for the Armored Battalion, as of yet, their anti-tank company within the same Armored Battalion as the four tank companies and two Armored Infantry companies, which were two of them within the Armored Battalion, was only beginning to reach the new line of contact, thereby setting up to prepare to fire their potent long-range HJ-10 anti-tank missiles. These HJ-10s were extremely powerful, large, and long-range anti-tank missiles, having just over two times the range as the American tow missile system. Loitering munitions in the form of the nearly ubiquitous, fairly inexpensive and cost-effective and mass-produced in enormous numbers CH-901s were also in the skies over the battlefield, which had the option of manual operations via the operators or AI targeting and could be armed with a handful of different warhead types depending upon mission requirements or educated assumptions based solely upon changing actionable intelligence. The latter often provided quite impressively adequate being operating off of the changing intelligence due to the advanced AI data processing being employed by the Chinese and their coalition allies within the conflict, making their ability to quickly adapt incredibly fast to changing battlefield conditions. Between the combination of ground-fired, missile-based, and loitering munitions utilized, the confused, disoriented, disorganized American forces due to lack of communications and working IT technologies due, of course, to the anti-SAT and cyber attack launching and kicking off the invasion had been rapidly annihilated in the span of mere minutes from the arrival of bombardment and coalition forces to the cessation of hostile fire exchange in just this subsection of the, of the battle. Only 20 minutes had thereby elapsed as far as the length of this total battle and exchange of fire. Forces attempting to flee were hit mercilessly, as shown on the map. When we go to this map, this shows the individual movements of the troops, their vehicles, 
within their different companies. And what you have here is you have a mechanized infantry company with their ZBD-04s and Type 63 armored personnel carriers. The troops are in their wedge formations. These guys are taking fire, but they're fighting back. These guys are trying to bound at them while they're bounding and covering. See, this guy holds still, puts down suppressive fire. This guy bounds ahead, then he puts down suppressive fire, then he bounds ahead and does the same. Well, these vehicles and troops are trying to also close the gap and get within grenade range and very close combat range, which closing on the enemy is a very important thing to do in battle because it improves your accuracy overall. If you're an infantry soldier, the closer you get, the easier it is to hit your target. Also, it puts you within range of weapons like hand grenades and other such implements on the battlefield just makes it in general easier to hit things now these forces were up on steep hilly ground at this battle as you can see the elevation here is fairly steep and when you're looking at it like this they're essentially going down a hill and there's another steep hill right here like a ridge line and you have these engineer forces trying to flee the battlefield as they're, as these two fobs were totally, utterly smashed by artillery fire. As you can see, the walls, the berms are completely flattened almost. All the tents and vehicles within them are totally obliterated, gone. You have caliber cruise missiles flying up from the 125th Coastal Defense Battalion's uh, caliber M battalion firing from TEL systems. <clears throat> A few hundred miles away almost. You have these loitering munitions, these CH-901As armed with heat warheads so they can destroy these Bradleys and uh, these engineering vehicles, armored personnel carriers like your M113s, your LMTV trucks, your fuel trucks, your M88 armored recovery vehicles here. Portable buildings like your command buildings, communication buildings, your storage buildings for ammunition, showers and bathrooms, tent facilities, guard towers. This fob is taking small arms and other fire. As you can see, this berm's being hit. And these guys behind the berm are popping up and firing back. They're taking heavy fire. Artillery strike's been called here, 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 here and all the way along their line of retreat. These guys are about to be hit massively by artillery fire. This is only one section of the fobs. These aren't even all the fobs. It's just the outermost fobs that were hit very first by all the strikes. Massive 155 and 152 shells hitting this area. Rocket artillery is hitting other areas beyond just this little battle segment here. But as you can see, these forces have high ground and they're firing down and advancing, charging down this more steeply elevated terrain, firing their anti-tank missiles, whether from the infantry forces with HJ-08s or whether it be from the IFVs firing 100 millimeter cannon rounds, 30 millimeter auto cannon with AP ammunition or blasting ammunition, or whether it be their HJ-08s on their side, or the, the pods on the side of the turrets, they're hitting these armor personnel carriers of the engineers and infantry fighting vehicles like Bradley, their armored engineering vehicle that as it's moving up, you can see this arrow surrounded by red being totally destroyed. Here's an MRAP. All these forces here are being wiped out after Taking fire themselves, the Chai Coms, after destroying these forces, maneuver around to attack these forces up on the hill. As their vehicles were already firing at them, providing fire support, as these forces at lower elevation move into position to get closer for within grenade range and other 
small arms range to be able to hit their targets far more accurately. Remember, all these forces employ small drones that are so many of them and they would be so small as quadcopters I couldn't fit them on the maps, but they're constantly feeding data to these guys into their combat data links in the vehicles and even to commanders and on the ground with handheld systems. Here's the tank forces. These are your Type 96 B main battle tanks of the tank company. Now they're on higher ground coming off this road here, this farm road. Now, before they even came in, they were already firing their tank shells from over a mile away, roughly two miles away, hitting targets in the area, already destroying a few vehicles. As their forces, combat data links updated their targeting data and their fire control systems, gun stabilizers, laser range finders, and more helped them put down accurate fire from their 125 millimeter tank guns. And some of these tanks fired anti-tank guided missiles from their barrels of their tanks, which they typically carried a few of those within their tanks as well, which were devastating on vehicles. More troops and wedge formation and mechanized infantry from this company providing support to their tank company. These are armored infantry, basically mechanized infantry troops, part of an armored battalion. These forces are the infantry support for their armor. These guys are advancing into the area, going downhill past the obliterated fobs, both sides, this side and this side, after they've destroyed the enemy. Now, they were taking some fire, especially on this end. You know, there was fighting. As you can see, the arrows with the green means that they were being engaged, being hit in many cases. And these forces here, they tried to retreat, but were destroyed in the confusion. And you have a farm here, as these properties leased out the land for the fobs to even have been built there during better times when they were doing their border operations. Oh, in the panic, this MRAP is trying to flee over here, but is engaged and destroyed by all the fire being laid down on the area. Of course, you have artillery called in here and here too, not just on this fob here and elsewhere in the line of retreat. But you generally have artillery strikes going on everywhere to clean, clean up the battlefield. This whole area is a giant kill box. This truck trying to go here amid these lower rolling hills being blasted and this one being blasted. This one being engaged, but it flees successfully off the battlefield. You can see it's just being engaged. It hasn't been destroyed, but it's taking fire. Whether that be small arms or heavier weapons that don't quite hit the vehicle, but shrapnel from them might when they hit the ground. Different things occur within battles. So... Occasionally, if you're very fortunate in a situation like this, you might just have a slight opportunity to escape, at least for a little while. Your chances would be much better on foot than in a vehicle, because in a vehicle you're a easier to spot target due to all this battlefield surveillance from the incredible ISR capabilities of the Chinese and the Russians as well and their allies. America no longer has the technological advantages that it had in the early 90s. That's all gone. Now, the enemies of America have become far more advanced in their technology. China officially leading the world in 37 of 44 major military technologies, which gives them an overwhelming advantage over everybody because they're the world leader in 37 out of 44 technologies. That even being recognized officially by America. Cruise missiles, the artillery, loitering munitions, tank guns, everything, IFV weapons, everything impacting, completely obliterates these forces, leaving nothing remaining. Even the small actual engagements where platoons of the brigade engineers and the mechanized infantry CHICOM platoons engage each other in actual infantry combat, 
The Americans don't last long as they're spotted by the quadcopter recon drones of the actual infantry forces and thus fire is able to be concentrated on their exact positions. Their vehicles are able to be quickly targeted and destroyed by heavier weapons. Even in some cases by HJ-08s carried by individual troops of the mechanized infantry forces. As we go back to the map, that very battle was occurring right here at the FOB chain of the 172nd Brigade Engineering Battalion. The next map that will be explored in the next video will be the combat occurring between the 536th Brigade Support Battalion and the strikes upon it by artillery, missile forces, and the 165th Armored Brigade reaching its objective, which was to destroy this battalion in the next Laredo Battle video.